Welcome to Off the Coast, where we examine the views from Vancouver Island with your host, Rosemary Barnes. New and exciting things, preserved and respected things, business, recreation, politics, travel, all from the point of view of the people living and working on the island. Rosemary is a professional speaker and certified speaking coach living in historic Ladysmith and loving every day of the island life. Here is your Vancouver Island host, Rosemary. Welcome to Off the Coast, Views from Vancouver Island. I'm your host, Rosemary Barnes, and today's show is named after a very famous Dr. Seuss book, Oh, the Places You'll Go. Today, it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to a lively and dynamic woman, Alison Donaghy. Allison is the owner of one very successful business, Sunshine Girls Painting, has just started another domino thinking and recently became a radio show host right here on bold radio station her show natural born speakers airs every saturday morning at 11 o'clock pacific standard time so be sure to tune in and listen to an hour of lively conversation the name of her show you know is completely appropriate because that's exactly what allison is a natural born speaker and when this woman speaks believe me it's worth listening In addition to running her multiple businesses, Allison also gives back to her community. She's involved with Habitat for Humanity, the Rotary, uh, Literacy Nanaimo, and she speaks to youth about the importance of the trades and making good career choices. Allison is dedicated to a great many ideas and ideals, but none more so than encouraging, she encourages people to think about what they're thinking. She loves to challenge people to be responsible for their thinking and their beliefs, and she calls herself a business chiropractor. Welcome to the show, Allison. Oh, man, Rosemary, thank you. God, I want to meet me when you say it like that. <laughs> uh, well, and that's you all over the place. So, Allison, oh, so I'm, I'm dying to know what a business chiropractor is. But before we get to that, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you ended up being the owner and creator of a, a – you were a woman and you created a business in the trades as a painter. How in the world did you end up doing that? Oh, man, it was just uh, like so many things that I do. I just kind of fall into things. Mm-hmm. And I, I just want to actually clarify, too, because I am no longer actually with Habitat for Humanity or Rotary, but they both carry like a really sweet spot in my heart because I totally believe in both of what they what they both do and accomplish around the world, both really amazing organizations, but I have stepped back from those. But I just wanted to clear that up because I don't want anybody going, hey, she's not there anymore. And <laughs> But in Thank heart you. and spirit, I certainly am. Uh, women in the trades, yeah, it, it wasn't all that easy. It was back in 99. Now, even if I go back a couple of years before that, I had gone to high school in the interior in Kelowna. And as soon as I graduated, I moved back to Ontario, which is where I was born and raised. And Within about a year of moving back there, I found out that I was pregnant. I was on the pill, and I totally, totally never saw a child in my future. But alas, the universe had other plans for me, and my parents were living on the island, and so I moved out here. While I was eight and a half months pregnant, I decided to drive across the country, because that seemed like a really smart thing to do, (laughs) without health insurance down through the States, the things that we don't think about when we're 19. And. So I came out here and I had my son who was his best, 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 best thing that ever happened to me. And what a great place to raise a kid. There's so much to do, so many sports, so much outside activity. And I was really, I got to give proper props to that. It, it's, it's great for that. So I was a single parent and I had to kind of figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I'd been working minimum wage jobs and I was still collecting welfare because, of course, you, it just wasn't enough to survive on did you finish high school I did finish high school yes okay and then when I moved after high school 
It was after high school, yeah. Um, after high school, I'd moved to Ontario. And right. I, w- I went to grade 13 there and didn't really know what I was doing. I was partying too much, drinking way, way, way too much. I'm not even going to talk about the other stuff I was doing. And, <laughs> and so really having my son probably saved my life. And mm. I was a bit of a wild child. And no. then I know, shocking, hard, hard to believe, but it is true. And so when I came here and I was, was working these jobs and I thought, wow, like, I'm never going to be able to give a future to my son the way that I wanted to. Like I know lots of people are really, really successful at it and hats off to them. But for me, it was never going to give me the life I wanted and the life I wanted my son to have. And that is such an individual thing for people. Yes. I decided that I should go back to school and get a degree of something. And I guess I was, I chose criminology probably because I was quite comfortable with the criminal aspect of our society. (laughs) And I thought, I could, this is a field that I could actually sink my teeth into. And I worked at a federal halfway house while I was going to school and realized quickly that it really wasn't the job for me. I'm a much better rule breaker than a rule enforcer. (laughs) And while I finished my diploma in that, I decided it wasn't an area I wanted to stay in. And I was working three part-time jobs. I was going to university full-time and trying to raise my kid. What did you do in your spare time? (laughs) (laughs) Did you go off and conquer a planet or anything in your spare time? (laughs) You're too generous. that That must have been exhausting. It it was. But, you know, when you're doing stuff and you don't see that there's any other way, there just isn't any other way. And being brought up in that generation where your nose to the grindstone and you work hard or you won't get anywhere was, mm. you know, I was probably maybe in the tail end of that that generation perhaps where I was raised by really strict parents, hence the wild child stuff. And we were, we were forced to work really hard and that was the only kind of thing I knew. I, I have some different views about it now, but I'm not terribly sympathetic to people who complain because they have to work 20 hours a week and it's so hard. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly not the one to bring those week. problems to. <laughs> no, no, they're no. going to get a, an awakening right quick, I think. I think so, yeah. And so I was working these three jobs. I was working in a retail store. I was doing data entry at the university, and I was working at the halfway house. And, and then I met this guy who painted houses, and we started dating, and he said, you know, you can, um, you could have a job painting where you're going to make more money per hour and therefore you're going to have to work less often and you're going to get to see your kid and I'm like sign me up like where do I do this this is amazing so he taught me how to paint and shortly after I moved into him he relapsed he was an IV drug user and life became Mm. very very complicated and very stressful and you know people say that there's always choices and sometimes there just aren't and and a choice that isn't viable is not a choice like I could have lived on the streets But I couldn't get income assistance to help me. My family wasn't um, supportive at that time. And so the only other real choice that I had was probably living on the streets. So you, you, yeah, it's with your son. Yeah. Or giving up your son or something worse. Of course, yeah. And uh, to me, those just weren't options. So you kind of struggle and you try to make do and you buy your stuff back from the pawn shop and and it becomes a really ugly existence. And then ended up with a brain disease and he passed away in 99 and I had dropped out of school because he and I had gone on a trip and I'd gotten some sort of odd Mexican flu and I couldn't back to school so I didn't finish my degree and I thought after he died well I guess maybe I'll paint I know nothing about business I'm just gonna paint and see what happens and so I did that for a year, and I realized that I really wanted to go back and finish my degree. So I you find painted, myself like, Sorry, I just want to clarify. You yep. painted for somebody else, like nope, in someone else's company? company. Nope, right then and there. Company. Well, yeah, that's the beauty of being young. You don't realize that it's not something that you should just jump into, even though it is something that we should all just jump into and do what we want to do. But, but as we get older, I think those decisions sometimes becomes more difficult because we have more knowledge about how things can go wrong. But things couldn't get any worse for me. I was back on welfare. I really, it was, it was crap. I was paying off this debt that he had racked up from his drug use when we were together. Uh, I owed over $10,000. And when you're on welfare, $10,000 is a huge chunk of coin. That it is. And so at the end of that year, I'd paid off all the debt and business was going really well. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go back to school. So no stranger to hard work, I ended up going back to school. I worked full time and I 
my business full time and then I went to school full time. Sure. <laughs> and, yeah, and I finished my degree and, with the help of some really amazing people. And and you had you were taking care of your son at the same time. Mm-hmm. And he was ten by this time, eleven, eleven. Okay. And so, you know, it wasn't like taking care of a toddler. So it was easier than the first time around. Wow. And and because I was still really jazzed about the business, and I was learning lots of stuff, and I had amazing support from some of my instructors and. Uh, some of the other professionals up at the university, I was able to to complete my uni- my degree in a year. So I have a Bachelor of Arts with a double minor in psychology and sociology. And then I went over to Vancouver to get a certificate to teach English as a second language. My son and I moved to Italy for six months, and I taught English while running the business. And so it was all really kind of crazy. Oh my goodness! Jumbled you- all up and. Yeah. Okay, Allison, Allison, has anyone <laughs> ever called you hyperactive? Do you, were you drinking inordinate amounts of coffee? Were you, how did you maintain that energy level? Uh, well, I, you know, I think it's just that mentality that you just got to do what you got to get done. And that had sort of been my, my um, operating system for so long. I just didn't know any different. Has it changed? No. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really no no it's uh anything worth doing is worth doing all out right there and is yes yes there is as yoda said do or do not there is no try yeah exactly right yeah and so my so son, there you are in italy yeah and i got sick <laughs> Something oh, yeah. about traveling and getting sick is crazy. So about 10 days after I arrived there, I started getting sick and it had some sort of environmental poisoning. And so by the end of the six months, I was I was done. I was so sick. I couldn't, I could barely walk. I had numbness from the knees down and oh, no. it was uh, it was a horrible sort of existence. And we came back and my son really, really wanted to come back. And even if I wasn't sick, I probably would have. He loves being here in Nanaimo on the island. He has such a homebody. And, you know, if he ever finds that great, girl he she's going to be really lucky because he is just born to be a dad born to be a husband born to just be in an imo and uh he's a he's a lifer here for sure hmm. and it'll be the gain the yeah, gain that's right and it'll be fun i think being a grandparent at some point because i'll be able to pay attention in a way that i wasn't able to with him and hmm. I, i'd never even held a baby before i had him so it's a little bit a little bit crazy. Wow. And then um, I thought I would leave Nanaimo when he graduated because I'm a gypsy and being on an island is, I find, really challenging. And then the economy just kept getting better. And I thought it was me actually being a Wonder Woman at work that just made it all work. But no, when the economy tanked, I realized it wasn't me. <laughs> oh, it was the economy. It was that funny little thing called the economy. And Uh-oh. So what happened yeah. to your business in 2008? Well, because I'd been running the company quite leanly, I didn't have an awful lot. I didn't have any debt. I didn't have any real overhead and because I really didn't know much about how the economy affects a business, because I was still thinking I was amazing, it took uh, me about a year longer than everybody else to realize that things were going downhill. And I've always had really super loyal customers, and that's kind of helped keep things going. But I did get to learn an awful lot more about business and aligning systems, which I guess is where the chiropractor stuff comes in, getting that alignment happening. Oh, okay. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Business and helping. That's right. And helping other people when they look at their business, streamline it, get really in touch with what their core relationship is with their business. What is that thing that matters most? And once that's identified, then all your systems can point in that direction. So you went from a woman who didn't know anything about business to owning your own very successful company, Mm -hmm. surviving 2008, and... (laughs) Now you're helping others with their businesses. Am I am I getting that right? Pretty much, yeah. yeah Whoa. It's a, and it's been something that's kind of been kind of happening and brewing in the background. People will come to me and say, "Oh, I need some help with this and I need some help with that." And I think when the universe keeps presenting you with these situations, you sort of start paying attention. I sort of start paying attention. And again, there's something else that I can fall into and and do, so is do is that with. what is that what domino thinking does? 
Domino that- thinking. Uh, no, yeah, that's one of the, the services that I offer is helping people align their businesses. And I'm kind of like a get in and get out kind of girl. Let's let's get you on track, change what needs to be fixed, and and then. I, I'm not into these five-year contracts where you have to meet with me every month and I'm going to charge an obscene amount of money. I just want to see you um, square up and move on. And that, cause that's where all the magic and the growth happens right after the alignment takes place. Right. right. And with domino thinking, I have always been, I've always really challenged. I, I, when people ask what my title is, I said, I'm the thinker of uncommon thoughts because I've always oh. been really, <laughs> Yeah, really challenging of the way society sees things, the way we see things are, the way that we don't, we, we have a belief system, but we don't follow that through and therefore don't end up in the place that we think we're going to end up uh, through our business, so through our personal life. So you're a thought clarifier. Perhaps, I guess. I, I've just, I want people to really take accountability for what they believe in. I don't want, pe- I don't want to change people's minds. I just want them to take that time, a time that none of us seem to have, but really take that time to think about what we think about and think about why we think about that. And yeah, it, it's, it must be it must be a bit of a challenge. I mean, people in the do or do not scenario. Mm-hmm. We often don't take time to think about why we're doing what we're doing. As you know, you do what has to be done. Mm-hmm. Yes. So what you're suggesting is that we need to sit down and, and actually follow through our thinking pattern to see if it's going to lead us where we think it's going to lead us. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be like a three-hour meditation every day. And if that's what works for people, great, do that. But it's, it's being accountable for what we say and what we think, what our belief systems are. And as I say, I don't want to change people's mind. The example that I use with people is pro-life, pro-choice. Like I definitely have my position on that. And if people believe what they believe, I'm totally cool with that. But what I, what I want people to do is, is think that it's not enough to just say I'm pro-life. You have to follow that domino progression and see where that last domino falls. And when you are doing, if you're supporting pro-life, in theory, if you are successful with um, criminalizing abortions, women are still going to have those abortions. They're just going to have them in back and back alleys again, and they're potentially going to die from or whatever. But if they get caught having one of these abortions, that's premeditated murder. And therefore, they could actually go to jail and be executed. And if you're okay with that outcome, then carry on, be a pro-lifer. If you're not, then maybe you have to tweak or soften up some of your belief systems at the beginning. Mm. And it, conversely, if you're pro-choice, then um, how do you rally against dying with dignity because is pro-choice not the person's right to do what they want with a body or their own body? And again, I don't, I don't want to tell you which camp to be in. I just ask that you think it through. And once you start thinking those sort of belief systems through, then it can be applied to so many areas of your life and mm-hmm. the practice of it becomes more simple and the outcomes becomes more simple and decision-making becomes more simple because you're aligned. That's exactly right. When I'm, because my company is, as well as being on the radio, I am a public speaker. And one of the things that I talk about is confidence. Mm -hmm. And like you, I'm not out to change anyone's core values. I'm just asking you to dig through and sort out the wheat from the chaff and come up with the absolute core of what you believe in. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to just whisk off some very nice pretty phrase but what do you believe in and how far will you go to defend it Mm -hmm. and once you know those things then everything else is window dressing yeah yeah right and i'm yeah and i'm way too busy to invest time and energy into changing someone's mind (laughs) oh and that's that is not my job i you know i don't i don't want that job i don't want that responsibility all i want to do is present things to people and then they can decide where they want to go with it after that that's that's completely true did you ever think did it ever occur to you when you were working three jobs and going to school and raising a child as a single mother that you would end up today where you are absolutely not 
No, it, like there's nothing in my realm of thinking back then what would have put me here. And, you know, I, I'm sitting in my office, in my house, having this conversation with you in the house that I designed and built in a city that I thought I would never stay in, in an area mm. that is just too beautiful for words. And I just, yeah, I never, and, and that's one of the reasons I oppose five-year plans for me personally, <laughs> uh, because it's impossible. I remember when I left my last house, my tenants were about to move in. I'm sitting in the house, everything's empty. And I thought, wow, five years ago, I never would have thought I would be here. Well, you know, and there's, there's the little wrinkle in, the, in your theory and mine that we agree mm-hmm. on is that to follow the dominoes through may not be sufficient Mm -hmm. because you don't know what other strand of dominoes you're going to intersect with. Right. Uh, Life definitely throws its its curveballs to you. But I think um, the domino thinking is not so much trying to predict all of the outcomes, but the potential landing spots. Um. How do you want to feel when you're there? Does this align with what your your core motives are, all of that? Like, you know, if you go back to that pro-life, pro-choice, if you're into pro-life, but then at the end of it, you could see that it could possibly end up with somebody's life being taken from them. Is that mm-hmm. not defeating what you're already trying to do? Are you going to be able to predict for sure that it's going to become illegal? No. Can you predict for sure that a woman will stand trial? No. There's all of these different branches and ways that it can go, but... I think we have a responsibility to think about those directions. And and I think those um, sociological thoughts are definitely different than your own maybe personal life or your business um, on, on setting goals and that kind of thing. And I, and I think there's a difference between the following the domino effect and setting hard goals for yourself. There's a very different fluidity that goes with both of those things. Yes. And hence mm-hmm. the title of today's show. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, the places you'll go. Yeah. I have ended up in some crazy places. Totally. Because I don't plan. (laughs) (laughs) So, and the perfect example is that I just booked a trip to go and see Kim, who started Bold Radio Station. Uh, It was one of my stops along the way on this trip that I went. I was going to three cities. I went to Chicago, Detroit, and Lansing. And I was stopping in Detroit to see her. And she lives in Birmingham. 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 Birmingham, Birmingham, Birmingham is just across the border from Nanaimo. No, that's Burlington, from, isn't it? That's Burlington. Yeah, so Birmingham, Birmingham is in Detroit. In Alabama. Wait there, a minute. Yeah, I see, and know. that's where they sent me for when I booked my flight. They sent you to Birmingham, Alabama. Uh huh. And I went. Oh, uh, I didn't even notice. I sent Kim my itinerary, oh. and she she was the one that told me I was going to Alabama. And I'm like, no, I'm not. She's like, oh, yeah, you are. Oh, oh. So. You know, three days or whatever it was. No, it was actually an error on their part, and uh, because they never clarified that which Birmingham it was, and so and that's so typical of me. And I end up in the most bizarre places because I don't (laughs) plan, and and then I find myself somewhere and go, "Whoa, all right, well, let's see what we can do with this." (laughs) So it's uh, it's a it is it's an adventure though. And I love, love having new experiences. So it all ties in so nicely with that. You mentioned um, that your son uh, mm-hmm. is is going to stick around and call Nanaimo home. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, do you see him often? Do you, um, how does it work with Tom, with your son? We, I have the best relationship with my son. I am one of the luckiest people alive. I'm certain of it. My son is, he's just, he's incredible, and uh, I'm sure other people think he's not perfect, but I think he's pretty damn close, and, <laughs> but I'm mom, right? So, right. you know, I may be a little bit biased. Oh, no. Um, but he actually works for my company, oh. and he will actually, is working towards, I'm saying actually a lot, holy smokes, he is going to, he's moving in a position where he's taking over things and that's freeing me up to to work on domino thinking and it's a transition and it's it's a slow transition and it's a growth process for both of us so we work together he lives in the basement suite of my house 
and it's he may as well be paying for his inheritance rather than somebody else's. Mm-hmm. So we see each other all the time. We travel together. We go on trips and do fun things. And once a month, we try to get away together and not talk about work to remind ourselves that we still like each other. Ah. Because when you <laughs> with a family member, sometimes that can be forgotten. And yes. It's, yeah. yeah, we have we have a really good relationship. I know somebody had said one time, I was listening to a speaker and they said, it, there's a really simple process. If you go home and you ask your, your partners, your kids, whatever it is, how they rate your relationship out of 10 and what they would like your relationship to be and how what you have to do to get to that number. And he had said, and I, I guess I'm a little torn right now because I don't know... He t- speaks about this publicly, but then I feel like I'm kind of telling somebody else's story. So I don't want to attach his name to it, I don't okay. think. Um, <laughs> but he is, uh, he's a local guy. He's a speaker. And he said that he went and spoke with his son about this and asked his son, how do you rate it? And his son was like, I don't know, five out of ten. And he was mortified because being a dad was like super, super important to him. And then he was like, what, what do we have to do to make it better? And he said, well, you need to stop talking to me so much. <laughs> I thought, wow, like amazing insight when you ask somebody else what it is that they need or they want. And it was, you know, I think I'll forever be in his debt for giving me this little thing. And I said, so I asked my son and he goes, oh, yeah, we're an eight, maybe a nine. And I'm like, whoa, that is like so excellent. And he goes, yeah, we'll never be a 10 because, well, you know, perfection's not possible. He goes, so I'm really happy. And I thought, oh, this is so brilliant. So I have a relationship with my son that's an eight or a nine all the time. And, and I love it. That's amazing because one of the things that w- when we when we have children is part of our job is to make them independent so they don't need us anymore. But boy, mm-hmm. we sure do hope they want us. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. it sounds to me like like you've managed to do that and and are remarkably successful at that, just like you are in everything you're touching these days. I guess so, but God only knows how I got there because, damn, I don't, I don't think I, I, I was one of you know how some people are just born to be parents. Like my son is born to be a parent. I, I don't know how my kid didn't starve to death or get left behind at a mall <laughs> or <laughs> I didn't take some other kids home from the park. Like you know, I just uh, I always felt like those characteristics that make a good parent were missing, but then. I've ended up with this really great relationship. So perhaps there was something going on that I still don't understand. Well, and not only a personal relationship, but a business relationship as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's got to be a great deal of trust. So I'm curious now. So when you're, uh, we can pretty much assume that, that I know, I don't think we ever clarified. You are a residential painter or are you a commercial painter? Both. Your we do interior and exterior, residential and commercial. So we'll do anything from um, a wall in a bathroom to a four-story exterior condo complex, shopping mall, that sort of thing. Uh, we are totally set up and capable of doing all of that. And it's been – working in the trades has been a really interesting journey. I highly recommend people get some sort of trade under their belt. Even if they're going to be a lawyer, go to hairdressing school. Or go to bartending school or do something so that if your big plan doesn't work out, you have something to fall back on. You're always going to be able to, you know, if you're traveling, you'll be able to get a job as a bartender or a hairdresser or a painter or whatever it is. It's having a trade is, I think, so fundamental to being flexible Mm. and having options and being that, a woman in the trade was certainly an interesting journey. <laughs> well, yes, at that time, that wasn't a common thing. No. You think, you, okay, so you must have come across, because, as the owner of a company, a trade company, mm-hmm. did you run into the quote-unquote old boys network? Did you, you have to fight to be um, recognized as professional and capable? Well, or did you just bull, bulldoze them over? <laughs> I opted out. You know, it, when I first started my company, I named it Sunshine Girls Painting because when I would go painting for my ex, I, I, do you call them an ex when they die? I don't know. Uh, so when my deceased boyfriend 
guess. I don't know. There's, I'm sure there's some politically correct term that I have no idea what it is. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not all that politically correct. No. Um, no, I'm not. And no. so I... I'd go to these jobs and people would be like, Psh, you're a girl, you can't do this. I'm not talking money with you, blah, 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 blah. And so when I started the company, I said Sunshine Girls because I wanted people to know that they were dealing with a girl. I never intended it to be an all-female company. And even Sunshine is spelled S-O-N because I had a son. I mm. had a son. And that's where the sun in Sunshine comes from. It's actually on my website too, the whole little story about it. And when I started going to the paint stores after I started my company and people, other painters realized that I was, I guess, their competitor, uh, it wasn't, I wasn't well received. They, I would ask questions. They would tell me lies uh, about oh. how to do it, what product to use. And fortunately, I was smart enough to pick up on most of them and I didn't fall into the traps. But I got to the point where I just went, you know, this is sucking up time and energy and trying to get them to accept me. I don't need their approval. I really, I don't. And I'm just going to advertise and try to make my company customers as happy as possible and keep my head down and work. I don't have time for that other stuff. I have life going on. Yeah, and it's so my biggest... Yeah obstacles came from other painters accusing me of false advertising and that kind of thing when in fact it, my customers have no issue with it at all um, I'm really clear and I'm upfront that this is how it is and they're like that's cool we're dealing with you and you're a girl and that's great right mm -hmm. um, but it I can see how people would get really bogged down and beaten down by it it's just I just didn't have the time and Opting out, as I say, was kind of the best solution for me. But the beauty in that is that I didn't have anybody to copy. And I got to make up all my own rules, all my own systems, everything as I went along. So my systems have a very female flair to them. And I've designed my own color selection system, which I'm actually going to offer an online course for. I'm in the process wow. of putting that together because it empowers people to avoid all the pitfalls people make and to then um, make their own color choices and not rely on somebody else telling them what they like. And I'm, so I'm in the process of putting that together and then I'll start marketing that. Now, and, are you going to market that through Sunshine Girls Painting? Yeah. Or, or, okay. So then tell me, uh, domino thinking. I'm still confused about what you do, <laughs> what domino thinking, uh, what, what the core value of domino thinking is, and which direction you want to take that. I understand well, domino thinking is about, is about getting people to, to, uh, in fact, think about what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but how how are you going to do that? And to whom are you going to offer it? And what vehicles are you going to use? And and I'm I'm still kind of a C as to what domino thinking is. Mm -hmm. And rightly so. It definitely is kind of has an uncommon start to it. And I think it it is morphing like almost every good business will do it morphs from one thing to another uh while finding its groove and meeting the needs of the the audience right now i'm focusing on speaking publicly doing professional speaking and through businesses and business networks asking people to consider thinking about business differently instead of maybe more of that traditional model looking more at an intuitive model which is how I became very successful because I had no business training. Um, ROIs and margins and all that meant nothing to me. And, mm -hmm. and still on some level, they still don't mean anything to me. The way I measure my business success is how do I feel when I bump into my customer in the mall? How do I feel when I'm able to take a trip because we had a great season? How, like, that's how I measure my success not whether or not I made the profit percentage I had set out for myself at the beginning of the year. Uh, do and you think... So, mm, go ahead, go ahead. So the domino thinking will encompass some of that talking to businesses about how to think differently about things, how to un have uncommon thoughts, and how to use those to your advantages. And 
thinking, talking about more social issues too. I just spoke at Power Talks and I know you've spoken with them as well. Just about how do we see things? Are we just accepting the fact that we are on this course of female enlightenment or are we just not as far along as we think and we fall into this trap of thinking that um, we are being far more successful in this feminist movement than we actually are? And even if feminism should be a thing or actually I could just go off on a whole other tangent there so I'm going to stop. I could join you on that tangent. I could so join you. So you're right. We should stop. Otherwise, we go on for days and days and wave our little flags of righteousness. And essentially, like up until two years ago, somebody actually two years, I guess it was about two years ago, somebody accused me of being a a feminist. And I was like, I am not a feminist. And and then I got off the phone and I thought about it and I thought, well, actually, I guess I am. Like, why do I have such a negative response to it? And I think I have negative response to it because I want to be an equalist. There it I is. I want as opposed to – but I think the pendulum has to swing. There's definitely a need for feminism. There was in the past and our sw- pendulum swinging and I'm hoping it's just going to swing back and sort of settle in some sort of equal state. And I couldn't agree more. I'm, I, it concerns me a great deal that women are creating the same kind of bodies uh, – I don't mean physical bodies, I mean uh, uh, social interaction bodies that are the exact duplicate of what they're fighting against. Mm -hmm. And so an equalist is a good, let's coin that word. Okay. Okay, not a feminist, but an equalist. Yes. That would be grand. So, And you know, in all fairness, I've had that conversation and other people have brought up that word, so I don't think we can coin it, but... Oh, feel so free to use it. Yeah, you mean we can come up with something special all by ourselves? Mm, no. Although I did come up with the word "talk aboutable," and I know as a grammar Nazi, you probably hating it, but I'm kind of loving it. Talk aboutable. That's yeah, I'm digging word. it. That's a mm-hmm. great word. So the world of public speaking then mm-hmm. is is that's a completely different ball of wax than being the owner of a painting company. I, I guess in a way, yeah. It, but, you know, I think there are things that keep coming up in our life that lead us towards, like, um, a direction. And I spend a lot of time talking with my customers one-on-one about what their needs are, educating them. And if they decide to go with another company, then they decide to go with another company. I really believe there's work out there for anybody who's good and, and um, tries hard. And not just the fly-by-nighters. They eventually just get shoved out of town. So there's not enough work for them because we don't want them. Nobody benefits from that. Um, But I think that – oh, God, where was I going? We were going with (laughs) the the similarities and differences between running a paint company and being a public speaker. Yeah, so, you know, talking a lot to customers one-on-one and really public speaking is a conversation with the one and the many. And it's not – I, I don't know if it's any different. It's about talking to people, finding out what their needs are. And yes, I may be standing at the, on a stage or in front of a crowd, but it's still a conversation. And then with, with through the business, I worked with young entrepreneurs where I would go into a high school and I would talk about careers and budgeting and that sort of thing. I talked to a couple of CAP classes about career selection and how, how to go about finding a career, what the trades are like, if the trades are a good fit, what kind of trades, thinking outside the box. And, and so it keeps morphing. Speaking just keeps coming back into my life. It's and going to get it you. Just, it's going to get you. Yeah, it appears like I, it got you. <laughs> it did. I love it. I really I love getting up there and talking about things that other people either one haven't thought about or two are afraid to say. And we are, you know, we are afraid to say things. The political correctness uh, that you eschew, that you say, I oh, know I'm not politically correct in the is is in some situations, easier to live with than in others. Mm -hmm. And you really have to know how to read your audience. But it would be the same thing as reading your customer, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, yeah, there is that. And I think what it all comes down to is intention. 
Now, if I, if I intend to be rude and discriminatory, people pick up on that. And if I intend to just be stating the obvious, like there is a black man, there is a Chinese man, there is, you know, <laughs> there are people who will get their knickers in a twist because I identified somebody as being a black man. <laughs> but they wouldn't get their knickers in a twist by identifying me as being a white woman and that it's somehow something different. And that kind of political correctness, I'm not interested in correcting because I am not being disrespectful. I'm not being rude by saying that somebody is black. They are black. And I think there are people who will, will definitely rise up about it and, and be pissed off to hear me say that. But there's something bigger going on than me saying somebody was black. I agree with you. I mm-hmm. agree with you. And I can't you. control I agree that. With you. No. Yeah. No, and then the question, of course, becomes, do we, do we abide by whatever is uh, ailing at them, by whatever is really biting at them? Do we try and find that out? Do we try and talk that through? Or do we leave them alone to stew in whatever soup they've created? Well, but- I think if somebody wants to have a conversation about it, I am more than open to having that. We may come out of the end not agreeing which is totally fine i don't need people to agree with me and i don't need to change their mind but i'm always open to hearing what somebody's opinion might be and where their position is doesn't mean i have to agree doesn't mean they have to change their mind uh it do just means it, mm. do you think any of this has to do with the the one of the latest uh uh hot topics is emotional intelligence mm-hmm. do you think any of this has to do with the emotional intelligence of the of of people in general oh i don't know i think we are all wounded in ways that we can't identify and it rears itself at really odd times and i think you can be really emotionally intelligent and still get triggered by something and have no concept of where it came from mhm and the the way that I see that working in a positive outcome is by then having a conversation about it. So if somebody gets triggered because I said somebody was black, then and we have a conversation about it, we can maybe talk it through, come to some sort of understanding um, of each other. But it's when we don't have a conversation, somebody goes away pissed off and it never gets resolved. That's, I think, the danger. I don't think it's... Um, that I pointed out the color of someone's skin. Mm-hmm. Right? The, the mm-hmm. danger is that we don't, somebody leaves with bad feelings. The, I agree with you. I agree with you. And yet, it's the sensitive topics that have caused the, out, the, 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 the negative response in the first place that are exactly the conversations that people don't want to have. And I say, bring them on. <laughs> Uh, but Absolutely. You, like, I want to talk politics with people. I want to talk uh, race. I want to talk sexism. I want to talk ageism. Like, I want to talk about that stuff. It's it, it, well, yes, but you are an extremely brave woman. <laughs> or crazy. Okay, I'm going to clarify that. You are a brave person. Thank you. Many others would have succumbed under the remarkably heavy load that you were carrying uh, as as a youngster coming from Naughtyville yeah. and Revel, Rebelville mm. to becoming a mother and a business owner. And but yet you still have managed to maintain that spark of of who you always are. You're still being a rebel. Oh yeah. Till the day I die. Like, I'm seriously, you know, that expression about you don't get any points for dying looking great or whatever. No, I am skidding into home plate with tequila, and, you know, <laughs> probably flying my own plane or something crazy. Oh, um, yes. so, yeah. so tell me, tell me, speaking about that, what else is on? I mean, you have done remarkable things, amazing <laughs> things. And but I'm sure that your bucket list goes on and on and on. You know, I don't even have one. Because if something occurs to me to do it, I just go do it. Like, mm. and I'm, 
and I'm really fortunate. Like, it's almost like my brain doesn't allow it to pop into my head until the universe says I can handle it. I don't know. Wow. But it, uh, you know, I went to Thailand, Southeast Asia last year for six weeks. It wasn't even on my radar to go. And then it was just like, oh, I think I want to go there. And it started out as a two-week retreat in Thailand, in South Thailand and Phuket. And then I went, oh, well, I'm not far from um, Bali. I could just go there. Yeah, I was far from Bali. <laughs> <laughs> Bali is like a seven hour fucking trip flight. It was crazy. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Because there was a stopover in, in Kuala Lumpur. And, and then I had a three hour drive from the airport to my hotel where I was staying at an Airbnb. And I just thought, yeah, this was another one of my great plans. But what an amazing adventure that was. And then I went through Cambodia. And then I went to Chiang Mai. And it turned into six weeks. And it was wonderful because my son had the opportunity to run the business. He did a great job. And then I, I had this really terrific experience. And it wasn't on my radar until it could be on my radar. And then I went, oh, this is what I'm doing. I'm falling into it. And wow. so I've been, I've been really, really fortunate. And I guess it's one of those things, too, that being single helps because I don't have to take somebody else into consideration. I don't have to take somebody along on the journey or think that their feelings are going to be hurt. And so I, I have a lot of freedom in my life, which I value probably above almost anything else. So you've, you've never been married? No, I am not and the marrying type. <laughs> you're not. So you're a dyed-in-the-wool, I'm going to maintain my single status. No, not necessarily. I just think it'll take a really um, unique and special guy to make me um, consider it. Mm. You know, and and if it comes along, great. Like, I'm open to it. But if it doesn't, I'm having a good time. Uh, it's You see, other people... You see, Allison, you really are... A, uni a unique woman because <laughs> a unique person. Well, I don't know why. I I'm okay clarify. with being called a woman. You don't have to correct that. I'm I am a woman but, and I'm but, proud of it. But, I'm proud of the stuff that I've accomplished. I'm proud of the other women that I meet. And it, being an equalist, I don't think takes gender away. I think it amplifies what we are really, really fabulous for, whether we're male or female. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that there are differences and our differences should be celebrated. I agree with you completely. When men and women are not the same. Oh God, no. Not the same, but no. we are equal. And, and, and we, I don't want it to be samists. I don't want to be a samist. No. <laughs> I like it when a guy holds the door open for me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I want a guy to buy me dinner. And yeah, I'll have no problem folding his laundry. Right? right? I don't see that as being unequal. I think that's equal contribution but it's not the same, so it's not the same as it is an equalist. <laughs> it, 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 it. <laughs> yeah, so you can call me a woman, a chick, a girl, a bitch, whatever you want to. Like, I'm okay with most of it. Well, whatever you are, you are <laughs> unique. Uh, <laughs> because other people uh, band together for strength. Mm. You know, human beings are social creatures. And and we like to band together for the for the comfort and for the, the the power that it gives us to be in groups. And I'm not saying at all that you you don't enjoy groups, but your your strength, your core is your belief in yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm seeing here. Do you agree? Quite possibly. You know, although a lot of times I feel really scared and insecure and uh, wondering if it just wouldn't be easier to conform. I definitely have those times in my life where I think, why do I keep bucking the system? Would it just not be easier if I accept the status quo? But I'm alive when I am challenging the status quo and when I'm pushing my own boundaries and when I'm trying new things. And, and then I find some like-minded people and I go, yeah, there's more of us and this is great and we can do all sorts of things. Like I just went to Lansing for a great um, opportunity to meet some really amazing women. And now we're all going to New York next month for what? a conference. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Isn't that great okay. for a weekend? I'm just like, tell so me, sorry. tell me what conference you're going to. It's called um, Thrive in New York City. And it's a woman, her name's uh, Wendy Timmons. And I met her because she's going to be a guest on my radio show. 
And this woman, her gift is totally, totally about connecting people. I, I, I joke and I said to her on Facebook, I said, you might not be able to stop a war, but you would be able to bring the pissed off parties together to a dinner party and sit them <laughs> at the same table. And, it was, and then uh, you would take over and make them challenge their thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, well, I don't know about that, but she is so gifted with that. And her gift brought all of these really great women together at this uh, Thrive in Michigan um, retreat, which is under the same umbrella, but a totally different event. It was more of a workshop as opposed to a big conference. And she, uh, I'm, I know these women and I are going to be friends for life. And I'm so thrilled to have that, that substance and quality and connection I will be forever in her debt for setting that up. And and then Wendy is going, a friend of hers manifested this idea that she was going to purchase Julia Child's house. And she oh. did. What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And so now Wendy's going to be moving there to Paris, or to France for um, a year. And she's going to be producing a document, documentary about it. But it's all about, she's just this master um, mindfulness manifester person and Master she gets mindfulness. Shit done. <laughs> I don't even know. Like, is there titles for people like her? But so being around people who are like that more and people who are um, like they're scared and they do it, as opposed to people who are scared and bash other people doing it, is mm. just what really keeps me going. Do you think that your audience, how big do you think your potential audience is for? Allison, Allison, oh. as, Allison as the uh, the the businesswoman, Allison as the speaker, Allison as the radio show host, Allison as <laughs> Allison. Do you see now? I'm challenging your thinking here. Mm-hmm. How how big do you see your reach ultimately getting? Oh, I don't know. I honestly, I. I don't know, and I don't even know how much I care. It's, uh, I'm really moving down this path and this course, and I think I am going to just encounter the people who need to hear what I have to hear. And if it's a group of 10 or a group of 10,000, I don't think it would matter. Because even if I got in front of 10,000 people, there may only be like 10% of people who are going to go away and go, I can apply this. This is great. I get it. Or maybe there'll be 90% of the people who get it. I don't know. And that's not my responsibility. My responsibility as I see it is to start talking about it. Mm -hmm. The audience will happen. It, it, you have such a belief in, in it will happen. How did you ever come by that? Because everything you know, in my life others, just happens. Uh, do you think that that was really just um, – um, I guess what I'm getting at is do you believe in fate and destiny or who's in – who's uh, uh, or do you believe you are causing this to happen by something you're doing? Um, how yes. do you feel about that? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I think that we – there's, I think we have a purpose of what we're supposed to do, and it may or may not be known to us, and or we may know, may have known it and forgotten about it. And I think that was definitely my case. I didn't, I, I, I still don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but it's putting one step in front of another, and you know, I'm I'm fortunate enough to have people like Lynn, who owns Crave Radio Network, which is now joined with Bold Radio Station, which is what we're listening to right now and what we're talking on. And Lynn is this great person in my life who just tells me to do shit, <laughs> <laughs> like my radio show. She's just like, "You're having a radio show," and I'm like, "I am," and she goes, "Yes, you are." And it, I think, when you have people around you that you trust, um you're just able to trust and what a journey it's going to be. And maybe it'll lead to something and maybe it won't, but I am meeting the best people. Like 
the people that I'm talking to, either the ones that are going to be guests or the ones that's not good fit for, I am just meeting the best people. And, and I think that takes you down a path and, and it just happens organically and you end up where you end up. And is that where you were supposed to at birth? I don't know. So I don't know how much I believe in the fate. Like, is am I supposed to be here right now? Is this all predetermined? I'd like to think not. I'd like to think it's a more... Um, ping pong type journey where you bump into something and then you bounce off of that and you bump into something else and you go zigzag down this imaginary road. Mm. But I think that uh, you, you figure out what you want, how you want to feel about things and then you just try to make that happen. The, the, I think that in my very humble opinion <laughs> that Having you on Vancouver Island is a major coup for Vancouver Island because you are so much bigger than Vancouver Island. Oh, that is like so sweet. Thanks, Rosemary. But, well, let's think about this. I mean, if you are here to, if, if, if one of your purposes, if one of your goals is to get people thinking and your vehicle for doing like that is to start conversations with them how better to do that than via a radio show yeah and a radio show that is that has a global reach Mm -hmm. yeah i so Perhaps Lynn has hidden wings and is <laughs> guiding you because well, I, I'm definitely at the point where I'm just like, OK, and she's told me to do some pretty ridiculous things. And oh, I'm dear. Like, okay. although the, the odd time I will say no, she wanted me to do some naked video thing. And I'm just like, oh, that's going to go with Excuse me. I'm going to have to have a chat with Lynn about that one. That's, it that's... had something to do with a spinoff of a commercial and it's like, you know, talking about the parts that shouldn't be talked about or something. I don't know. But uh, she made me laugh at that. Every once in a while she brings it up and I'm just like, yeah, I'm not convinced. That's not yeah. quite the same as having a radio show. No, no, not quite. So then my my final question to you, mm-hmm. and I'd like to talk about this a little bit, is... It, because you are involved in a number of businesses and it's a creation of mm-hmm. a couple of businesses, what is the best business advice that you could offer someone? Oh, um, know who you are. And if you know who you are and who you want to be and align everything else up with that, you're going to be great. You're going to be fine. It's when we, we start doubting ourselves, when we start letting other people identify who we are and assessing who we are based on their rose-colored glasses or foggy glasses or whatever hell kind of glasses they're wearing. That's where the danger happens. When we start looking at somebody else's and comparing ins- our insides to their outsides, that's where the danger occurs. Uh, everybody is just trying to figure it out. And so stick to your own business, figure it out, know who you are, and just trust I love that saying, comparing our insides to their outsides. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it actually is a saying that stuck with me from when my, uh, my painter boyfriend was in recovery. And that was, that's one of the things that they say because it's such a dangerous thing to think that you're an absolute mess and then you see somebody walking down the, wall, the road and they look like they've got it all together and they're smiling and you're like, oh my God, I'm such a failure next to that. And you know, you're not inside. They could be a bigger mess than you are. And it's really none of your business. That's an amazing saying. Mm. Don't compare your insides to their outsides. Yeah. Yeah. As, yeah. As the, as the, um, creator of confident stages, Mm -hmm. may I borrow it? It's not mine. You can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Because yeah, you have at it. I'm giving you permission to use somebody book. else's expression for sure. <laughs> well, thank you. That's Because that's lovely. how I roll. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, so, so what's next for you? What are you going to be doing? It, I know you don't make plans, so please don't reach <laughs> through this, through the radio lines <laughs> it waves to hit me. But wh- what do you see yourself doing in a year, where would you like to be? I have no idea. Oh. You know, I want to be somewhere where I feel like I have freedom. I have, want to be somewhere where I feel like I can be creative, uh, where I feel safe and loved. That's where I want to be in a year. 
that's where I want to be every year. And that's where you are already. For, yeah, for the most part. You know, there are still some times where I feel like I would like to be a little bit freer. And, uh, but, and I like to be, have more of those things. But I think that that's, a, that's, that's the way life is. Sometimes we just, we're not, sometimes we're only an 8 or 9 out of 10. And that's okay. As long as we keep moving towards understanding what that 10 is. And definitely, like I'm listening to um, lots of stuff right now, especially like Danielle Laporte about your core desires. And, and I think she's nailed it. I think she's absolutely brilliant. I want her on my show. Uh, <laughs> just putting that out to who the is, universe. Who is that? Danielle Laporte. She's, oh. she's incredible. And if I get her on my show, Lynn will be extremely jealous. So I need to totally work on that, making that happen. <laughs> Excellent. So Yeah, but I think, yeah, definitely how you feel is more important than what you have. How you feel is more important than what you have. You know, that's a wonderful place. And uh, it looks to me like we are about out of time. Mm. It's my, my, my radio here is saying that we're at 2 o'clock. Allison, thank you so much for being on the show. You are an absolute font of, of inspiration to Aww. everyone who is, who is trying to conquer themselves. And, shucks, and, Rosemary. And, oh, yeah, shucks from you. Shucks. That's amazing. <laughs> I and know, I, I didn't say holy fucking shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I would also like to thank our producer, Nesha, for, for uh, making the call very smooth. And until next week, this is Rosemary Barnes, the Maverick Voice at Confidence Stages and the host of Off the Coast Signing off, and we'll look back to seeing you back here again next week. Thank you for listening to Off the Coast, Views from Vancouver Island, with host Rosemary Barnes. To book Rosemary as a speaker or speaking coach, or to offer suggestions of extraordinary guests for the show, please visit her website at www.confidencestages.com.